Good morning. Welcome to our Sabbath School morning lesson from the beauties of Ebenezer Erskine. And as we gather together today, I want to begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our awesome Heavenly Father, you who have given to us this glorious day, this day where we remember the resurrection of your Son from the dead, we give thanks for his atonement for our sin. And we give thanks for the heavenly places which he has promised uh, to his people. Dear God, may you cover us in your grace. May you encourage us in your peace. And may you continue to show us the beauty of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear God, we pray for your encouragement and for your mercy. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning we're going to continue to read from the beauties of Ebenezer Erskine as we continue to look at his sermon on the faithfulness of God. Let's go now uh, to his uh, fifth uh, point. The faithfulness of God is yet further engaged to believers in the promise by giving a pledge or of the, his full performance and the pledge he gives is a more worth than heaven and earth. Oh, say you, what is that? I answer, it is the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the surety of the inheritance. From Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. If ever thou felt the Holy Spirit breathing on thee by his saving influences and operations, Thou hast the earnest of his inheritance, a pledge that all the promises shall be fully accomplished in God's time. You know, if a man gives a pledge, it is a security of the full bargain. And if a man uh, does not fulfill his bargain, he loses his pledge. So here, God will as soon forfeit his Holy Spirit as break his word. And is not this notable security to the believer? Is not this a high engagement of the faithfulness of God? The faithfulness of God is yet further engaged in the promise by the concurring declaration of the most famous witnesses that ever bore the testimony uh, in any cause, jointly attesting the truth of the promise and the veracity of the promiser. From 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The Eternal Father attests the truth of the promise with a thus saith the Lord. The Son attests it, who is the essential and substantial Word, for He is the truth, the Amen, the faithful and true witness who speaks in righteousness. The Holy Ghost attests it, for he is the Spirit of truth leading into all truth. He is the Holy Spirit of promise, not only because he himself is promised, but because he testifies of the truth of the promise and faithfulness of the promiser. And by his power and efficacy, seals and stamps these upon the soul, whereby he works faith and believing. Now all these three witnesses are one. Not only one in essence, but one in their testimony. And what is the testimony and record of the Trinity? It is this from verse 11. That God hath given, granted in his covenant of grace and promise, to us eternal life. And when this record or testimony of a Trinity is not believed, we make God a liar. From the whole, you see what high and deep engagements the divine faithfulness has come under for the outmaking and accomplishment of the promise. Oh, then, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. For faithful is he that hath promised acceptance in the beloved. But now, after all that has been said, some may be ready to object. It is true, the goodwill, power, and veracity of the promiser are excellent encouragements to these who have a right to the promise to draw near to God in Christ with full assurance of faith. 
Let us draw near again with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Now again, as we see the hand of God continuing to work in this way, we know that there will be doubts and fears. Lest I have no claim or title to the promise of welcome into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by that new and living way. An answer to this leads me to a fourth ground, taken in connection with the former, upon which faith may build its assurance in drawing near to God by the new and living way. And that is the endorsement or direction of the promise of welcome through Christ. To whom, say you, is the promise endorsed? I answer, it is directed to every man to whom the joyful sound of the everlasting gospel reaches, as we see in John 3.16. There you see that the promise of acceptance and of eternal life through Christ reaches forth its arms to a lost world. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So here, whosoever draweth near to the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, through the mediation of the great high priest, shall obtain grace and mercy to help them in time of need. The covenant of grace and promises thereof are so framed by infinite wisdom in the external dispensation of the gospel that they look to every man and woman and, as it were, invite them to believe and obtain this great and wonderful mercy. He that sits on the throne of grace calls everyone within his hearing to come for grace and mercy, assuring them that come to him who will, he will in no wise cast out. And we that are the heralds and ministers of the great king, whose name is the Lord, merciful and gracious, have warrant and commission to proclaim that to you men the sons of men is the word of this salvation sent. The promise is directed unto you as a ground of faith. The promise is directed unto you, to you and to your seed and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. There is not the least change, but the call and command of believing is to everyone. Otherwise, unbelief could not be their sin. Now the promise and the endorsement and direction thereof must be as extensive as the command has right to the promise as the immediate grounds of his faith. And whosoever actually believes and builds upon this ground has the promise in his possession. Take away the promise from the command of believing. You separate what God has joined together and effect command men to build without a foundation. It is true, Christ is the object of faith. But it is as true that, that he can only be the object of faith to us, as he is brought near in the word of faith or promise. Romans 10.8 tells us this. And therefore, seeing the promise is to you and me, and everyone who hears this gospel, I may warrantably say with the Apostle in Hebrews 4.1, Let us fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. From which text it is plain that the promise of an everlasting rest in and through Christ is left even to those who, like the Israelites, may come short of it through unbelief. And how is it left to us but to be applied by faith? Christ, our elder brother, has left us confirmed testament in our hands to be improved and used in a way of believing in order to our being actually entitled to and in due time fully possessed of that rest, which is the purchase of his death and blood. Oh, then let us fear lest when the promise is thus left us, we should seem to come short of the possession. For the promise can never be ours in possession, though left us, unless we believe. As is plain from the words, me following in verse 2, where it is added concerning the unbelieving Jews. 
the word preached, i.e. the promise of entering into his rest, as is plain from the connection, did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. A king's proclamation and promise of pardon to a company of rebels cannot profit any of them but such as accept of it. A legacy left by latter will of a rich and wealthy friend to a certain family without specifying one individual person of the family can only profit that person or these branches of the family who claim right to the legacy upon their friend's testament. But to the rest, it is unprofitable because through pride or ignorance or sloth they forsake their own mercy. Or suppose a letter should come endorsed to me containing a banknote of fifty, hundred, or a thousand pounds sterling, or more if you will. The endorsement of the letter to me gives me a right to carry the bill to the bank and ask payment. But if through pride or conceit that I am rich and increased with goods, I will not receive the letter nor ask payment of the sum, in that case, I come short of my own privilege, and it becomes unprofitable to me. I own that in every one of these similitudes there is a dissimilitude. The only use I make of them is to show how near Christ and his salvation is brought unto us in the word of faith and promise, that thereby we may be encouraged to draw near by the blood of Jesus with full assurance of faith, saying he is faithful, that hath promised acceptance in his new and living way. To all that is said, I shall only add. Let it encourage us to draw near in full assurance, that there is no lawful impediment to hinder our access and success in entering with boldness into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Every bar and hindrance that stood in our way is mercifully removed by our great high priest, who is over the house of God. All the impediments that can be pleaded on God's part are the law, justice, and holiness of God. And all of these can be pleaded in our part is sin. Now none of these ought to hinder our drawing near in this new and living way with full assurance of faith. As for the law that cannot be a just impediment to hinder our access, for that moment the soul enters by Christ as the way to the Father. The law gets its end, Christ being the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. Now can the law be against its own end, or that which gives it its due? All that the law demands is a perfect and sinless righteousness. Give it that, and it has no more to seek. Now this the law gets, that moment that a sinner believes or draws near to the blood of Jesus. What the law could not do, and that it was weak to the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8, 3, 4. From whence it is plain that every soul is made perfect by Christ because he has paid the perfect righteousness for our sin. But at once to roll away this impediment, let it be considered that this new and living way of access to the holiest is only given for sinners. Christ calls not the righteous but sinners to repentance, to enter by him as the way to the Father. If you were not sinners but righteous, as Adam was before the fall, you would not need to enter by the blood of Jesus. But seeing the way and the door to the holiest is just shaped and calculated for the sinner. Let not the sinner scare to enter into it by the presence of God especially when he calls us who are sinners to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Faithful is he that hath promised acceptance in the beloved. Amen. As we heard from Ebenezer Erskine today, the door of the gospel is open for all. 
all who would draw near and come and see their need for Christ. The offer is free. The offer is for sinners. The offer is for all who recognize that they are weak in the flesh, that they are unable to save themselves, that there is nothing good within them. This is who the gospel is for. And so brothers and sisters and others who may be listening and seeing this, I plead with you this day, come and welcome to Jesus Christ. Come and rest in his blood. Rest in his righteousness. Rest in his love for you. For you being a sinner. Christ has shed his blood. Come and see the beauty of Jesus Christ. May you be blessed today. And you, may you find rest in this Lord's day. Where we put aside the labors of this life. And see the beauty of our Savior. Amen.